MTS, it was a bit confusing, and so they created the uh, sector carrier pair. I, okay. So I gave you one example, but let me uh, share with you again that. Okay. So now, on on your screen, we have this uh, picture. So let's say we are using 120 degree sectorization. Okay, that's uh, here, 120 degree uh, sectorization for our area here. This is the base station, uh, node B. So this node B is taking care of three regions. Each region is covering 120 degrees. So that's 120 degree sectorization. So this portion here is, that worse or not? is called sector alpha. So that sector alpha is now your cell. So this is cell alpha. This will be cell beta, so the home. right? And this is a cell gamma. Uh, and if you are not asking a question, please <coughs> mute your uh, phone. We can hear your voice. OK. Uh, OK. So cell alpha, cell beta, cell gamma. So each sectorized region is your cell. So let's say you have deployed at uh, 700 megahertz your LT system. OK, 700 megahertz FX, uh, 10 megahertz deployment. So you are using that here, that's FX. Uh, then you can reuse that here, you can reuse here, just like CDMA. You can do that. So this is one cell, another cell, another cell. So in this picture, we have three cells with 120 degree sectorization used. And E node B sectorization. And our one E node B is taking care of three such cells. So it controls three cells, manages the radio resources in three cells. If you do 60 degree sectorization, then of course you will have six cells, right, and E node B will then control six cells. Okay, is it clear? Can you have one more than one cell in a single sector? More than one cell in a single... Like in UMTS, you could have two carriers, and therefore there'd be oh, two, two cells. Oh, yes, so you can have... Oh, yes, I see, I, I understand your point. Okay, okay, yeah, so you could have... Yeah, so let's say you could have Fx, okay, and uh, here, and then you could have Fy, another carrier. Yeah, so you will have so-called uh, uh, one cell here, another cell here. Correct, correct. That is also supported, yes. You can have multiple carrier frequencies. This is one 10 megahertz carrier. This could be another 10 megahertz. So, yes, that is, of course, supported. That is correct. Okay. Any other additional information needed? Well, that's great, thanks. Okay, you are welcome. Okay, uh, any other questions? So again, um, if you prefer to use this medium, the audio bridge, then go ahead. This is your chance. This is the opportunity. The opportunity is knocking on your door. <laughs> Answer that door. Any question? I will start my 30 second timer. No question for 30 seconds. We move on with the presentation material. The time for you to reset that timer. But of course, uh, we like your questions that you have been submitting through the audio, I mean, through the live meeting. So please uh, do not stop that, continue doing that. But in addition, this is your another medium for questions. Going once. Going twice. Okay. So let's uh, mute the bridge. Okay.
But to please, please. The conference has been muted. Question box. Okay, so let's continue our journey into this uh, architecture. Now, so far we looked at the nodes. Okay, so we looked at uh, E node B, then MME, SGW, PGW, EPDG, HSS, etc. Now we will consider some interfaces. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, how about the interface? Well, one interface that we have is between E node B and SDW. That is the user plane. That's why you would see S1 dash U, user plane. Okay. Now, how do we carry packets from, let's say, SDW to E node B? Okay. So basically, uh, the packet has arrived from the outside world to the PGW and now PGW to the SDW. Now, SDW will put that packet, IP packet, inside so-called GTP tunnel. So here there is something called GTP tunnel. User plane. GPRS tunneling protocol. Oh, where is uh, that guy? Uh, not this. <laughs> Hold on. I picked another session. Oh, okay. Good. So we have the GTP tunnel user plane and we will put that IP packet inside that tunnel. And to place that packet inside that tunnel, we need the help of some protocol here, GTP protocol. Then below that we have the UDP uh, as our transport layer mechanism. Then we have the internetworking layer, that is your IP. Any layer one or layer two could be used. So typically, let's say we will use optical fiber or microwave or something like that. But that is not defined. Go up to the operator, whatever that operator wants to do. But the main idea is that we need some sort of uh, protocol such as GTPU to help us carry the packet between these two nodes. Okay. That's the GTP user plane protocol. How about the control plane? So this is the interface between E node B and the MME. It's called S1 MME. If you want to be more specific, the protocol that controls that interface is called S1 application protocol. S1 application protocol. And examples of things we can do using this protocol, let's say I want to do authentication. So the MME will send authentication message to the base station, which will then forward it to the UE. So this is one example. So any kind of core network related message that we want to send, uh, we can send that using the help of the S1 application protocol. Mm, the S1 application protocol will construct the message and send it to the lower layer. Uh, so here we use SCTP. In general, we have, let's say, TCP, we have UDP, we have SCTP. Now we have this kind of option for our uh, transport layer. Uh, in the control plane, we have chosen uh, SCTP. So think of SCTP is a better version of TCP. And the reason that we are saying that is just like TCP, it provides reliability. Okay. Not only that, one SCTP connection will help you carry messages for many, many users. If you are using TCP, you need one TCP session for one user, and another TCP session, another user, and so on. But now, we said, oh, we don't need to worry about those multiple TCP connections. We will have a single SCTP connection, and that will help us 
carry messages for multiple users. So it makes it more efficient. So that's why we chose to use backup. The lower layer, internet login layer is IP, any layer 1, any layer 2. But in summary, the protocol that controls this interface is that's an application part, and this is primarily for signaling. Uh, the earlier one we saw, this is for the user plane. So user traffic passes through the S1 user plane between e node B and as it does. Okay, now let's talk about the uh, inter... Oh, we have one more comment for... Oh, security. So you mean uh, security... Oh, you mean... HTTP Pro can provide security. Uh, please uh, cl clarify your question. Maybe you are commenting that HTTP also supports secure. Maybe that is your question. Okay. So we'll wait for some additional details. Okay. X2 interface. X2 interface. S is stream, yeah, stream control transmission protocol, SCTP, that is correct. S is a stream, that is correct. Stream control transmission protocol. So maybe one stream, one user, another stream, another user, and so on. That is correct. X2 interface between two inodbs, and we already say that, okay, that will help us with the handover. So the handover signaling messages will pass through the X2 interface. Not only that, uh, we can also uh, forward a packet. So we tunnel the user packet. So let's say that we got packet P, Q, R, S, and so on from SZW. We got those. The UE was here, and we sent out packet P. So packet P, no problem. Everything went just fine. Now our user is moving. The user is moving towards the station number two. Now we will exchange handover signaling using the X2 interface. And we make a decision for handover. So then we have to now communicate between E node B2 and the user. So what will happen is during the transition period, we will set up these tunnels, X2 tunnels. And using that tunnel, we will forward these leftover packets, packets Q, R, S. And then they will arrive at the base station number two. And now from the new base station, we will forward the packet. So we have this capability of tunneling the packets. And when you do that, you basically minimize the packet loss. So even when you cross the boundaries of the base station, no need to worry because we can do the tunneling of the user packet. So this kind of forwarding uh, is uh, done uh, using that extra interface also. But once the handover is completed, once the UE is firmly established here, then from the SDW we will start getting packets directly. So a packet after S, packet T, U, V, W, and so on, they are now coming from the SDW directly to the E node B number two. Okay. But during the transition, we have this capability. Okay, so Nick has this uh, question. Uh, do we have, okay, I think secure encoding. Oh, so my, my understanding is that uh, these uh, tunnels, uh, we can um, provide security. So we can do the traditional IP type security, maybe IP sex type uh, security. That is possible. And when we establish the tunnel uh, as part of the call setup, then we will have uh, some specific uh, identifiers. So we will attempt some tunnel IDs, uh, and we will have some uh, ID given by the E node B, given by the MME, etc. So we will have um, pretty secure uh, uh, interfaces. Of, so yes, yeah, so no need to worry about security. So we can indeed implement those uh, security mechanisms. Good question, good question. Very good question. Okay, then what else? Okay. Yeah, one more thing. I meant 
function one of the benefits of LT compared to Vimex. Uh, multi cell radio resource management. So basically, uh, this guy can say that, oh, I have, uh, okay, let's say this is uh, our overall spectrum bandwidth. So the base station one can say that, oh, this part of the spectrum is uh, experiencing heavy interference. So I have a lot of interference on this part of the spectrum. It will convey that information to the neighboring base station too. So the base station says, okay, I will uh, not allocate uh, that part of the spectrum to my users for some time period. So we have these so-called intercell interference coordination uh, possible using the X2 interface part. So those are some of the main functions of the X2 interface. But the primary reason is to support uh, handover. Uh, backhaul. Normally, when we hear the term backhaul in 3G, we are thinking about the connectivity between uh, the base station and the RNC. So that is our traditional backhaul, right? However, in uh, LTE, we have sort of two types of backhaul. So we have the normal radio and the core type backhaul, which uh, which is uh, S1 interface, okay, and here we are more worried about user play, S1 user play, so that will uh, require a lot of uh, scrutiny because uh, we are talking about 300 megabits per second in one cell, and you may have three such cells, three sectors, so you are looking at uh, close to one gigabit per second. That is only down. Okay. Think about the uplink, 75 megabits per second times three. So we are looking at a very very high data. So we need to provision uh, enough bandwidth on the S1 user plane so that we can carry that kind of very very high speed data. So that's uh, very very important. The standard doesn't say how to transport information. Maybe we'll use optical fiber. Maybe micro. So wherever possible, probably we'll use fiber. Both AT&T and Verizon Wireless have invested quite a bit in fiber optics. Okay. So we have the fiber to the home, that kind of deal available, right? Verizon has this fear. Right? So we already have uh, put a lot of effort and a lot of money into that. So I would suspect that mostly it will be fiber, but Wherever it is not available, maybe we can do some uh, wireless backhaul uh, using, let's say, microwave. So those are also possibilities. Okay, so that's one backhaul. Another backhaul is this X2. Now, the X2 will not be a high speed as S1 because uh, S1 is carrying a lot of data. X2 is only the handover related stuff. So we will be moving packets around only during limited time period, only for the handover users during the transition period. So X2 will have a, a little bit lower requirement in terms of the bandwidth, but um, S1 will be your main uh, backhaul that would need quite a bit of uh, provisioning work. Okay. Let's get answers to this question here. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to uh, for you to answer this question. So please, please participate. We have about 34, let's say, yeah, 34 participants, 35. So let's see how many of you are awake and how many of you are really physically present physically and mentally present. Okay, so compared to last time, we are making some progress. Looks like some folks are uh, back from that meeting. So now we have 29, okay, very good. So come out 24, we are making progress. 
but please please participate looks like my begging does have some effect on some of you so i am seeing more participation very good i will give you 30 more seconds oh i need to hide the result okay so x2 interface where is it Okay, so what do we have? Okay, ninety-six percent accuracy. Very good. So it is between two E node bases, two base stations. Very good. Okay. Okay. Now we will take a look at the air interface protocol stuff. Now the air interface between the UE and the E node B is called UU, okay, or sometimes LTE-UU, LT-based air interface, UU interface. So over that UU interface, what do we have? We have this protocol stack. We have the physical layer, medium access control, radio link control. This is like radio link protocol of 1X and 1X video. Uh, PDCP packet data convergence protocol, radio resource control, and hopefully the acronym list has all these acronyms defined. Physical layer, P physical layer, P five, whichever way you want to pronounce, there's your physical layer. Okay. Now, what does the physical layer do? For example, we say that. We are moving away from CDMA. We are now going to OFTMA type techniques. So that's what we are using. OFTMA approach. We use advanced antenna techniques such as MIMO. So that is here, also part of the physical layer. Uh, the MAC layer will do the scheduling. So for example, which user should get how much data rate? That is the scheduling. It can also take care of priority handling. So let's say I have space for thousand bits for some user. Then I will say, okay, what kind of data do I have? I have voice or IP bits, very good. I have some sort of email bits. I need to send some email. I have email bits. But then the Mac says, oh, voice or IP, high priority. So let me first fill up the packet uh, with my voice or IP bit. So I will fill up the packet first with voice or IP bit and whatever is left over space, I will put uh, some email bit. So MacLear will do that kind of prioritization. Uh, radio link control, radio link protocol. So we know that that is the retransmission, automatic repeat request. So when our physical layer fails, then the RLC says, okay, I will take care of the retransmission. So retransmission is the responsibility of the radio link control protocol. Uh, PDCP, that is your header compression implementation. So you can compress the IP headers. Ciphering, if you want to secure the air interface, you can encrypt information. You can do ciphering. That will be also responsibility of the PDCP layer. Okay, on the top, we have radio resource control. This is your signaling layer, layer three signaling. So as far as the air interface is concerned, with the UU interface, air interface, uh, you have RRC as the main layer that will implement signaling. So basically, 
this layer will construct signaling message. For example, uh, we want to do handover. So to control the mobility, RRC layer will construct handover command type uh, signaling message. It will help you set up the connection, tear down the connection. So again, signaling messages are constructed by the RRC layer. So from the air interface perspective, the signaling is taken care of by the RRC layer. Okay, let's look at that protocol stack first from the user plane perspective and then from the control plane perspective. User plane means we are doing some IP traffic, email, web browsing, that kind of stuff. So from uh, PGW, so here is our internet, some sort of web server, let's say. And in fact, it's the internet the routers from routers to PGW the SDW. So SDW receives the IP packet for that user, and then it will use the help of the tunnel, GTP tunnel, to forward the package to the base station. Now the base station has this full fledged pure IP packet for the user. So it says, okay, maybe I should do header compression so that it is more efficient. So then we will use the help of PDCP layer, packet data conversion protocol. So that's header compression. Okay. So then we give it to the lower layer, radio link control. So here we will give some sort of sequence numbers so that we know that, oh, packet number two, packet number three, some packet is missing. If some packet is missing, we can do the retransmission. So the RNC will take care of sequencing, give that to the MAC layer. MAC layer may do some prioritization if needed. Otherwise, it will forward the information to the physical layer. Physical layer has OFTM is implemented. So it will send out the packet in terms of OFDMA technology. Some sort of OFDMA symbols are sent. The physical layer of the user equipment will receive the OFDMA symbol. It will give that to the MAC layer, MAC to the RLC, to the PDCP, and finally the Internet Explorer window will display the home page, maybe CNN.com home page. So this is the end to end path as far as the air interface is. As you can see, the user traffic did not pass through RRC because RRC is only for signaling. So the actual user traffic does not pass through the RRC. Radio research can do that is for signaling, not pass only for signal. So if you are taking care of signaling, then you need the help of RRC layer. Now, following the basic UMTS philosophy, we have two kinds of uh, messages. Let me quickly uh, introduce a couple of terms because if you are reading the standard, you may see those terms. And these terms are not new in LT. They are used in basic UMTS. But uh, if you are from the DO background, then you may not have seen those terms. So there is, uh, we have two kinds of uh, stratum or strata. We have access stratum and we have non-access stratum. Now, how do you differentiate uh, between the two? Okay, so things that are related to the radio network that are considered part of the access stratum. So, for example, handover, handoff related signaling. That would be considered part of the access stratum signal. Okay. On the other hand, uh, things that are related to the core network.
we consider that part of the non access set so let's say i want to authenticate the user now the authentication messages will be exchanged between the mme and the ue so in that case that authentication is considered part of the non access set so that message will go to the e node b and e node b has this rrc layer radio resource control because as far as the air interface is concerned rrc is your signaling mechanism so it will put the non access set a message here and then that message will go to the ue ue's rrc layer will open up that message and say oh this is non access data message maybe it is authentication message so core network related signaling is considered non access data and the radio network related signaling is considered the access data signal so for example when the e node b sends uh hand over command message hand over command as part of the message call rrc reconfiguration so whenever we send that message rrc message that message is considered access term because it is related to the radio net okay so let me summarize access term means the signaling message that is related to the radio network and the non access term means the signaling that is related to the core network but as far as the air interface is concerned we have to use the help of rrc so over the air here is the e node b here is the ue so over the air we have to use rrc that is your signaling protocol so it will carry both the access certain and the non access certain message because over there there's the only thing we have okay Uh, we have a question uh in this video there is a arq plus rnc does it imply that we more return oh in lt we can consider the uh, sort of uh, user such that it will send the report uh, when certain conditions are met uh after some time there could be some time timer associated with that so we can indeed control the number of the rrc type report okay so uh, it's not necessary that we will have more retransmission okay because you can uh, always uh, control the frequency of those reports there are several ways of controlling that So no need to worry about having more retransmission in it. So no, that's not a problem. And in EVDO, we have NAC-based RLC. Right? Um, whatever is missing, we report uh, those. Uh, here we can report those. Uh, uh, I mean, we can report uh, the sort of the birth of rlc segment that we have received correctly and we can also mention what is missing so, so we we have that kind of uh, functionality so not uh, necessary that we will have more retouch we have a way of controlling that good question good question okay okay but anytime you want more details please ask a follow up question otherwise i'll assume you no know news is good news you got your answer okay so as far 
as their interface is concerned, UU for signaling, we will use RR2. So even when you want to send non access set a message, it will be given to the RRC. RRC will then pass it down to all the lower layers. Physically, we send the message. We are passing all the layers again and then press it. Authentication message is now received by the UE. So as far as the UU is concerned, again, we rely on RRC. Okay, time for a question. I will give you a couple of minutes to provide answer to this question. But please, please participate. Please participate in the poll. I will give you one more minute. Some of you are working on it, so let's wait. And keep your questions coming. Thirty seconds. Okay, uh, eighty about eighty percent correct answer. So RRC. Okay, that is the correct answer. So as far as the air interface is concerned, we rely upon the RRC layer. And I mentioned just few minutes ago. Oh, did I mention? I say that. As far as the air interface is concerned, right, we use the help of this RRC layer. It's the signaling protocol. So it helps us send out not only the access data message, but also the non-access data. So both are carried by the RRC signal. Okay. Very good. Thanks for participation. Let's go back. A presentation. So the next topic uh, for us is to get an idea on how the handover between LTE and a non-LTE system uh, would work. So we take an example, uh, uh, one example for UMTS and one for the one XE video. The core network, of course, uh, is a common framework, and the idea is that we can connect any radio access technology to the same core network. And that way we can move seamlessly across those technologies and we can still maintain end-to-end -end connectivity between us and some sort of server, maybe web server. Okay. That is right. So all IP approach here will 
help us maintain such seamless communication exit. How does LTE work with pre-LTE 3G systems? So here we are showing you two basic ways. We are just taking two examples, one the UMTS access here and uh, one XPVDO access. So going from, let's say, LTE to UMTS, Right. then we will use the help of the tunnel between SCW, serving gateway, SCW, and the UMTS uh, access. So maybe uh, it could be the just uh, RNC of UMTS. That is one possible approach. So we will use connectivity between SCW and the UMTS access to support interworking with UMTS. If you want to support interworking between uh, LT and 1XC video, then we will use the tunnel between TGW and the DO network. So let's say uh, some gateway, PDSN type gateway, which we formally call HRPD uh, serving gateway, HH. Okay. So we will use the tunnel between the PGW and the HSDW, which is like your previous for interworking between the P, between the LT and the 1X T video. So let's consider those two scenarios, the handover scenario. And we have one full session on mobility uh, between LT and UMTS. Another full session dedicated to interworking between LT and 1XC video. So if you're interested, uh, feel free to enroll in those sessions. Okay. So here is the interworking between LT and DO. Okay. So we are this mobile device leaving the UMTS LT coverage area. So we are leaving the LT coverage area, entering the DO only area. Let's say. So now, since we are going outside the LT coverage area, we have poor radio environment in LTE, and we are getting better quality signal from the DO system. So when that happens, the UE will send user equipment will uh, oh, the user equipment will send out uh, a message measurement report message okay. so it will send out a measurement report message to the e node so it would say that okay from the lt system i have weak signal strength and from the DO system, I have better signal strength. Now, the base station says, oh, okay, good idea for the user to move to the DO system. So that kind of handover decision is made by the E node B. There is no RNC, so all the handover decisions will be made by the E node B. So in that case, the base station will send relocation record back to the MME. MMA will communicate with uh, the DO radio network. RNC says, oh, we have to uh, make this uh, handover. So here is the relocation request. RNC will then uh, execute the call admission control algorithm. It will make sure that it has uh, adequate resources available. And once it uh, has uh, reserved the resources, such as MAC index, for the 1X video terminal, then it will send a traffic channel assignment message to the MM. The MME will then forward the traffic channel assignment message to the radio network.
and uh, EU plan no big says okay let me send the handler command message to the UE so it will send handler command message to the UE and inside the handler command message we have the traffic channel assignment of DU. So now you is ah these are my resources in the DU system. So then it will access the DU system and send the let's say traffic channel complete message in response to the traffic channel assignment message. So this is the overall picture. Now here we have given a simplified view, but uh, we have a whole session um, that will talk about various aspects of uh, this kind of handover. But once the handover is completed, then the information flow will be from outside world to the PGW, from PGW to HCW, HSCW, HRPD serving gateway, from there to the RMC, B station all the way to the user equipment. So that is the end to end flow of packet once the handover is complete. Okay. Let's talk about oh we have one question. Uh, this is called circuit switch fallback. Circuit switch fallback. Okay, circuit switch uh, fallback uh, is uh, different. Here we are talking about the pure packet data. However, um, let's say um, we, we got a call. So, me, so let, let me just uh, quickly draw a picture. So our device, let's say, supports uh, LTE, supports one supports one X video. So here is one X RTT system. Here is a LTE system. Now, we have a voice call, circuit switch voice call. So, uh, MSC, 1X MSC uh, will have uh, there is some sort of interworking solution that will help you work between LTM uh, 1X system. So, we'll send uh, some sort of page message here. Then we'll send a page message using the LTR interface. Now this UE gets this page message from the LTR interface and then it will access the 1X air interface to respond to the page message. And then we'll set up a call with the MSC, etc., etc. And once the call is over, we will come back to the LT. So this is called circuit switch fallback, CS fallback. So basically, here, uh, we, we use one uh, x air interface. to complete uh, call and then we come back to the uh, come back go back you can say go back because we were in LT earlier so go back to LT once the call is over so this is one kind of uh, feature that is uh, available for interworking between LT and 1x RTT Similarly, you have uh, interworking between uh, LT and uh, GS for circuit switch uh, calls. Very good. Okay. Let's go back to our handover discussion. So, we looked at the interworking between uh, LT and uh, DO. We took an example of handover. Now, let's take 
an example of LT2 is MTS handle. So similar, similar idea. So basically we are going the from LTE to UMTS coverage area. And since we are moving outside LTE, going into UMTS, we have poor LTE, we have a better UMTS. We said, okay, I need to send measurement report message. Goes to the E node B. E node B makes a handover decision, and then uh, it will tell the MME that oh, we need to do the handover. Okay, MME says no problem. Let me communicate with the target system. So it will exchange signaling messages with the SGSN. So oh, we need to have this uh, relocation taken care of. SGSN will ask RNC, do you have enough resources to support that handover? And then. RNC reserves the resources and it says yes we have adequate resources to support a handover and then uh, it will uh, uh, create uh, oops, sorry it will uh, send a message to the core network uh, so that we can create a tunnel and the tunnel will be between uh, SDW and RNC so we are constructing this stuff then finally, we'll tell MME that okay, the tunnel is. Uh, I mean, we have to construct the tunnel, but resources have been resolved. So let's uh, do the relocation. The MME will then uh, tell the base station here that oh, release all the resources, release the LT resources, and then uh, we are fully talking within the UMTS system. So the end-to-end -end information flow is between UE, E node, BRNC, SGW, and PGW. So similar to what we saw for LT to DO handover. That's the main idea. But if you go from LT to some other system, the LT will make the handover decision. Okay. Finally, where do we deploy LT? Here we are just giving you some examples. So in the US, uh, we expect uh, 700 megahertz deployment for LT. So both AT&T and Verizon, they have spectrum at 700 megahertz. So we will see LT deployment there. Also, a couple of other examples, spectrum, say PCS, you can do that. Advanced wireless service spectrum, you can do that. Uh, wherever you find the spectrum, as long as you have 5, 10, 20 mega spectrum, uh, that will be a good uh, a bandwidth. 10 megahertz is a reasonably good bandwidth for LTE. Okay. But some examples. Standard support, many, many, many options. Okay, let's uh, summarize. Why should we go to LTE? High peak rate as high as 300 megabits per second in the downlink, 75 in the uplink. It will help us uh, reduce the latency. Uh, we are becoming more efficient. Okay. So bit per second per hertz, pretty good for LTE. Cost per bit is going down. Uh, how can we get better performance? We use OFDMA technology, advanced internet techniques. IP-based uh, read in the core network will give us scalability, uh, uh, seamless mobility. So we have interworking defined between LT and 3G systems, such as UMTS and one next video. So that's what we have uh, for today. A couple of questions have come in. Uh, hybrid mode operation, where everything is controlled by the mobile. Oh. Not uh, really, not uh, really. Um, uh, it's a little bit different from the DO1X uh, interworking. Here, the network has a lot of control. So for example, let's say we are in the idle mode. So how should UE go from LT to DO? Right? How should it select DO compared and not the LT? So there will be something called cell reselection parameter and they will be sent over the air as a broadcast uh, information. So the UE will make measurements and use the network conveyed parameters uh, to make this kind of uh, decision. So in the LT philosophy, 
uh, we rely more on the network and less on the GUI. So network has more control in the basic UMTS uh, and hence in LTS. Uh, what about DO EVDO to LT? Hand over the same. Yeah, you uh, you can also go from EVDO to LTE. Um, now, uh, it is not as good as LT to DO handover, uh, but it still is supported. And the main difference is that if you go from DO to LT, you have to sort of uh, go into the LTE, let's say, idle mode, something like that. And then you establish a new call. So from the LT perspective, the handover looks like a new call. So, but we do have support for that. We do have support for that. Going from LT to DO is much better performance because you are sort of connected. You are going from connected to connected state directly. And here you are passing through some intermediate idle state. So slightly longer delay, but uh, it is support. It is support. Okay, thank you very much um, for your questions. Thank you for answering my questions. Um, at this time, uh, I would request uh, uh, Eric, probably Eric may be here, to send the evaluation from your way. But I'm not running anyway. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask questions. Yeah, Nisha, do you want to take any questions from the bridge, or do you want to just? Oh, hold. Oh, uh, uh, we can unmute the bridge. Okay, so I can answer questions using the bridge, and uh, they can fill up the evaluation at this time.